All right, everyone, I just finished reading chapter one of Breath by James Nestor, and I want to come at you all with a couple of key takeaways that I took from this chapter. So, two things. Number one, this is the Mariana Evans chapter. This is the chapter in which James Nestor meets Mariana Evans in Philadelphia. And this is also the chapter where Nestor begins the discussion of the evolutionary um, history of the human skull and how we went from having big, robust, healthy, attractive, symmetric skulls with no crowded teeth to the modern situation of asymmetry, tiny airways, crooked teeth, and uh, ugliness, uh, you could say. And his visit with Mariana Evans is wrapped up with that discussion because apparently, and I didn't know this, but apparently Mariana Evans, as well as another dentist, Dr. Uh, Kevin Boyd, are studying this collection of old skulls that are at the University of Pennsylvania Museums, and they're analyzing them as part of this investigation into what the hell happened to the human skull. Now, I've always known Mariana Evans as the MSE provider, right? She's the quintessential uh, MSE provider here on the East Coast. She teaches MSE classes. She does a ton of cases. She's a periodontist, uh, which means that as her patient, you really probably don't have to worry as much about negative periodontal outcomes of your orthodontic treatment because she is a trained periodontist who can keep an eye on your, your gums and on any negative effects on your teeth that the orthodontics might be having. I've just known her as someone to refer patients to on the East Coast for MSE treatment. But James Nestor doesn't even get into the fact that she's an MSE provider in this book. In fact, there's not a single mention of the MSE anywhere in this book, despite the fact that right in Chapter 1, one of the most uh, well-known MSE providers is visited and interviewed. So if he's not talking to Mariana Evans about the MSE, what is he talking to her about? He's talking to her about her analysis of the Morton collection of skulls. Now, the Morton collection of skulls uh, is, so in, in the 1800s, Samuel Morton was an American scientist who amassed a collection of skulls that were th ranging from thousands of years old to hundreds of years old from all over the world, from different uh, cultures and ethnicities, and he did his own analysis on those skulls back in the 1800s that Nestor describes as, well, racist. Um, but Dr. Evans is taking those same skulls and, let's say, making more positive use out of them. She is using them to try to understand how have skulls changed in the last several thousands of years. Okay? She's performing certain... Uh, analyses of their dimensions that show that earlier skulls were healthier and newer skulls are less healthy and we can see in the the change of these skulls over time the disevolution taking place and of course Mariana Evans being a practicing orthodontist has her own contemporary patients her current patients who she sees the modern situation of the human skull in its dire uh, status so Props to Mariana Evans for doing that anthropological work on those skulls. I had no idea that was happening, but that is very interesting. And gosh, would I love to go down and visit those skulls and and just um, take a look at that. I'm, I'm so interested in, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the bigness and the prominence and the beauty of those old, fully developed skulls. It's so intriguing to me, and I'd love to visit that myself. The other thing I wanted to touch upon in terms of takeaways from this chapter are the two evolutionary changes that resulted in the beginning of the disevolution of the human skull. And James Nestor gets into that in this chapter. He doesn't get into the more modern stuff like soft diet and lack of breastfeeding. In this chapter, I believe he'll probably get to those more recent environmental causes of the disevolution of the human skull. In this chapter, he's more talking about the older, more core 
uh, changes in human development that robbed us of our airways. And those are twofold. Number one, the development of the brain, the growth of the brain. And number two, the evolution of the larynx, which is a uh, critical part of human speech. So those two things, as they developed, had a negative effect on the human airway. How did the growth of the brain have a negative effect on the human airway? Well, starting about a million years ago, as human beings began to cook and, in general, process their food, we started taking in more calories due to that processing. Now, when we took in more calories and, and other nutrients, or, or nutrients in general, rather, our brains grew bigger. And when our brains grew bigger, they grew forward. And when they grew forward, they robbed the structures at the, the, structures at the front of the skull of real estate. So essentially, we traded airway real estate for brain real estate. Second, the development of the larynx. The larynx, as it evolved, made us have the ability to have more complex vocalizations. In other words, we could make newer sounds, we could develop speech. Speech has also been a critical uh, factor in human development. It's one of the things that distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom, is the fact that we have complex speech. But when the larynx evolved, and I don't fully understand the physiology, but when the larynx evolved, it had a negative effect on the airway. Essentially, it came down lower in the throat, the tongue followed it, and for whatever reason, that lowering of the larynx had a negative effect on the airway. So these two core changes, um, very early in human development, are already starting to have a negative effect on the airway, and I think as we proceed with this book, we'll start getting into some of the more recent environmental factors of the collapse of the human skull. But that's it for now. So on to chapter two coming up and uh, more insights to come. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I will talk to you all soon. Peace out.